Okay, I'm Rick Fleeter. And um, so what was this tremendous breakthrough in AMSAT that was causing us, I mean, they don't call it AMSAT for nothing. It's amateur radio satellite, right? So it's amateurs building satellites, hitting success rates that were better than the professionals building satellites, using cheap components that were not space qualified, and these kinds of testing methods that are highly, at best, unconventional. And so the, who really knows? I mean, you can't really say. But here's what I say about why that was. First of all, the satellites and the components were very, very simple. And therefore, going back to the simplicity argument, as things become more simple, they become more reliable. And, and we were just talking about this. As a matter of fact, the other part was the approach to testing was completely different in the AMSAT world. And we did things that nobody does with satellites, one of them being the thousand hour test, where you turn the satellite on in its own environment, just sitting on the tabletop, but not connected to anything other than maybe a cheater to charge the battery if you don't have sunlight to run on the solar panels, and just run the satellite for a thousand hours, send commands to it, see what happens to it over a thousand hours is like a month. So you tell that to a modern program manager, you want the, the satellite to just sit in a room and operate for a month just to see if anything, they just don't have that month in the schedule anymore to just do nothing, essentially. We did that. And, and another thing that we did that was very useful was that we um, tested the satellites in a way that nobody would test their satellites. We take the satellite, and I did this in AeroAstra also, put it on a little cart with wheels, right, and roll it out into the parking lot. This is partly illegal, but maybe it's enough time has gone by that I won't go to jail for it. At which point, we would turn the radio, we would operate the satellite as if it were in space. We had a ground station in the office. We'd call the satellite on its, you know, on its uplink frequency, cause it to turn the radio on on the downlink frequency. We usually had it attenuated so that it wasn't transmitting at the full 100 milliwatts, 1 watt, 2 watts. Nonetheless, it was an autonomous satellite sitting in the parking lot, soaking up solar power as much as there was from this you know, terrestrial solar, charging its batteries, talking to the ground, executing commands. Granted, it couldn't move, and we couldn't fire rocket engines, but we could certainly turn radios on and off and do all the to send messages to it, get messages back turn the thing off, cause it to go into a different charge mode. And we did that. We just played with the satellite. We took it through all of its modes, not through a test connector, but through the actual radios. By the time the satellite had gone into orbit, we had done everything. There was nothing different about being in orbit that we hadn't already done in somebody's backyard, you know, on the, on the little terrace where they have their barbecue or in the, in the parking lot of somebody's office at work. So anyway, through simplicity, through um, the fact that we did a really good job on testing and documentation, and you know, probably through a little bit of good luck and dedication of people who really cared, we were achieving very good reliabilities on relatively small satellites. What we considered a CubeSat back then was 14 kilograms, and there's a picture of one of those. We called them CubeSats. We didn't realize there was going to be another generation of CubeSats later, later on. What about since then? Because now we're in the kind of modern epic of small, more modern, I mean, let's call it contemporary, because modern is whatever you think it is, but contemporary means now, right? Contemporary, to me, is the last four or five years, 2011, 12, 13, 14, that I didn't do statistics on before. And what I found, AMSATs, Amateur Radio Small Missions Launched, 30 of them in 2011, uh, 33, 2012, 49 in 2013, and 61 missions so far in 2014. That's a lot of small satellite missions. I don't know what the reliabilities of those are, but the thing that I would say is that it, it seems to be an emerging, uh, an emerging activity, an emerging space activity. I think it's largely underappreciated the fraction of the total number of satellites launched that are actually these little satellites. And on this slide, I have pictures. They're really adorable. The pictures are really cute. There's the Planet Labs Dove, which they've launched, I think at this point, 69 or 79 of these satellites. Hardly anybody in the world realizes that there's 79 identical 3U CubeSats up there doing you know, very high resolution imagery of the planet with commercial customers. It's just amazing, A, that they're doing it, and B, that nobody knows about it. Then there's Bob Twiggs's pocket cube, because one, a 10 centimeter cube, anybody can do that now. So you know, Bob has got his um, five centimeter cube. And of course, when you go from 10 to five, you've cut the volume by eight. Right? Because you cut the linear dimension by two, and two cubed is eight, so it's really a lot smaller. A pocket cube is a teeny little satellite. And to make that look big, I have a little satellite on single circuit card about this big. And of course, Cornell has already built and flown satellites on a single microprocessor chip, 
with the solar panel, with the radio, everything there on the chip. So we can take these satellites to a size that's maybe not really relevant to doing any real missions yet. And then one particularly nice looking mission was started off, I still call it the MIT sphere, so even though NASA took it over and the, these satellites were built quote unquote by NASA, I don't know actually who built them, but it was an MIT concept to build little sphere. In the US we have this toy called Nerf balls, right? What are Nerf balls? They're kind of sponge on the outside. So you can throw this Nerf ball at the wall, you won't hurt anything. You can play you know, hockey or you can play soccer in your living room and they're so soft and spongy that they don't hurt anything so they took that idea and said okay we can fly these around the shuttle and if we happen to bump into the shuttle we won't hurt it because it's a Nerf satellite and that idea never actually flew outside the shuttle because NASA was too nervous about it instead they let them fly it inside the space station and inside the space station they have now become tool fetchers so instead of the astronaut having to unhook himself from the wall or herself from the wall and then crawl around all the little confines of the space station to go and get some other component that they need, screwdriver or whatever it is, they send the satellite on the errand and it propels itself with compressed nitrogen gas through the space station, gets the thing or someone gives it the thing and it comes back with the thing. So these little, they're like little robots that can run around and there's a picture on the slide here of three of those little, little spheres running around the space station. Okay, so those are kind of, that's sort of the history, if you want to look at it, up to today of what we're doing with small satellites. And the thing that I noticed in small satellites is there's this big thing about replacing big satellites with little satellites. And I'm very cautious about doing that because I don't think you do really replace big satellites with little satellites. I mean, but what happens when you build a new technology, a new way of doing an old thing, we use it exactly the way we used the old thing. IBM PC, 8088 PC, was basically considered an electronic typewriter. Not an electric typewriter. Electric typewriter, you press the key and a motor makes the print head hit the ribbon which prints on the paper. Electronic typewriter means you enter the words or the letters onto basically a screen and then you create a file and then you print that file. So that's a, that's a big change in how we think about typewriting, but still we thought of the IBM 8088 as basically a typewriter. And the very first ones, I was working at JPL when they came out, and the very first ones, they were secretarial tools as typewriters. And the idea where the technical people would want a typewriter was a little off-putting. Of course, we're not the typists, those people are the typists, those people who sit in the office at the end of the hall. So all we really did with the new technology was do the old technology in a different way. Then later on, Right, we realized, hey, you can do other stuff with this. You can do spreadsheets, you can do word processing, and it became a tool for technical people. We did programming in Excel, right? So that was kind of a normal thing to do. Same thing happened with the calculator. If you look at on my slide, the very, a very early Hewlett Packard calculator was basically like a calculator that you saw in a store where you type the numbers, pull the handle, and the only difference was there was no handle. The, you know, fantastic, right? You just type the numbers, they appear on the little thing as if they were on little wheelies, but they're not on little wheelies, they're on red LEDs as it turns out. And then instead of pulling the wheel, you press the enter button. But it was the exact same function. And it took a little while to realize, hey, you can do other things with this. For instance, you can build sine, cosine functions into it, you can make it programmable. You know, uh, this thing that you had in the grocery store wasn't exactly programmable, right? It had a plus key, and that was about it. So you know, it grew, but its roots were that way. The automobile being basically a horseless carriage. I mean, that, that means it was a carriage and you took the horse out and put an internal combustion motor in in its place and the motorcycle, which was basically a bicycle with a motor so you didn't have to turn the pedals with your feet, literally the motor turned the pedals. And that was how the, you know, the thing worked. And the cell phone, of course, which is a telephone, right? It's just a telephone except you don't have to have it connected to the landlines, that's handled for you by the cellular network. So the idea that big satellites in the future are going to, re little satellites are going to replace big satellites, to me is a little bit like saying, yeah, I'm going to replace the typewriter with an IBM PC. If that's all you do with it, why bother, right? Because the typewriter is highly reliable, easy to learn, and cheap. So if all you're doing is typing on a computer, why bother with a computer? You have to pay Microsoft more money for the operating system than the whole typewriter cost in the first place. You have to be able to do something else, and usually you do. 
So to go a little farther on this, are we going to replace macro? Because we're talking about the future of microspace. Is the future of microspace that we are going to eliminate macrospace from the planet and it's not going to exist anymore? Well, there's a lot of people working on that and it's totally valid in that we know how to make higher power through the use of deployables. We know how to do tighter pointing. There have been university projects. I mean, my favorite one of those was done, the most satellite done at Utias in Toronto, where they achieved you know, what was previously considered pointing accuracies reserved for the very highest quality remote sensing satellites in a satellite roughly the size of a briefcase that weighed in the tens of kilograms. So little by little, we have demonstrated the ability to replicate the capabilities of big satellites in little satellites. Of course, we've always had the high reliability of big satellites. We're really not there yet with delta V and with maneuverability, and we're working on, there are people talking about gigabit per second CubeSats. So there is the possibility of taking over some of these things, but, you know, and going beyond what we consider to be kind of conventional micro missions, which are tests and qualifications of, of things, niche science where you can do it, high, low resolution imagery and education and things like that. There are emerging missions, and I made kind of the remark in this slide, there's emerging missions in micro satellites, and are there any emerging missions in macro satellites? That's a really good question. It's not a field that's particularly dynamic right now. Most of the missions are variations on the theme of missions we've already done, whereas in microsatellites, we talk about missions that were never before talked about, one of them being servicing larger missions, having this sentry satellite that can separate from the main satellite and go off and analyze what's the matter with this satellite, why isn't it performing, or just make a video of the solar panels deploying so we would know how the solar panels deployed. Those are missions that have not existed before. Clusters and constellations have really not existed before. In the sense that we have GPS as an example of a constellation, but when you talk about a cluster which is unorganized, it's just a cloud of satellites, the only time that's been tried is with chipsets in very limited amounts of satellites. It would be an entirely new sort of a mission where you launch a cloud, the satellites each know which other satellites are capable of what and turn on the satellites that are well positioned to do a particular mission. And so, and the other thing is that small satellites bring in new constituents, countries, companies, individuals, organizations that haven't done it before. Okay, I have a couple of slides, the first one called in the year 2525, I mean since we're looking into the future, and they're basically looking at technology as a way to revolutionize space. And I'm very skeptical about that because I do think that technology moves on, but it does not fundamentally change the field. So if all we can say about the future of microsatellites will be just like the present of microsatellites, but the microprocessor will run twice as fast, it's like, okay, that's very nice. But that is not going to fundamentally change. So if you look at what's going to happen in information processing, what's going to happen in sensors, what's going to happen in in lighting, LEDs and lasers, what's going to happen in power and better batteries, what are the things that could be truly game-changing? And I think the ones, one that stands out that's been talked about for a long time is the universal navigation. Because every satellite needs to solve its guidance and control and navigation problem, and that's a really hard problem, and amateurs cannot do it. You know, high school students can build a satellite, maybe, but they're never going to figure out how to def define the attitude of the satellite from a star tracker, a sun sensor, you know, that sort of thing. And having the microcosm, as we call it, which means perceive the moon, perceive the sun, perceive the stars, perceive the earth, every mission has those basic components, and then calculate your attitude and orbit from those components and make that into a little black box that you just buy it and you have no idea how it works, but it works. And we sort of have that in the iPhone, right? You can point your smartphone into the sky at night and it tells you what you're looking at, not by seeing it, but by knowing what it's pointing at. So we'd like to have that kind of a navigation system for satellites so that me, the operator, can be fairly dumb and just know where I'm pointing. I don't, I think, you know, in the power area, a little bit better batteries is not gonna change things, but what could change things we talked about in the last hour was deploying, building solar panels in orbit, which would give a little satellite the ability to have many, many square meters, even hundreds or thousands of square meters of aperture is a complete change in what we could do in microspace. You start talking about a little satellite because the guts of satellites really aren't very big. And so if you're limited by power, if you're limited by aperture in any way, you can't 
collect enough solar energy or you can't collect enough light, the better we are at creating the aperture in space, the more favorable that will be to the microsatellites. So that implies what's on the next page, advanced deployables to make solar arrays, to make radiators, to make antennas, and ultimately the hardest problem of all is to make optics. You'd like to fly a three meter optic on a CubeSat. Just exactly how are you gonna do that? Because, okay, you can deploy a three meter balloon, but it's hardly optically you know, valuable. So that is a technology that could come along in the time span we're talking about, the next 40 years, let's say. Um, what I did talk about last night is basically infrastructure. Again, infrastructure would change everything because we wouldn't be burdening the satellite, as the most trivial example, with the need to communicate to its own ground station and squeeze all of its data into 20 minutes a day. And that's a really tough thing and drives the whole design of the CubeSat. And it also drives the budget because then the CubeSat sponsor has to have their own ground station. And how many people have a ground station at home? Zero. And then you have to rent a ground station. I mean, how does that work? Whereas if the satellite can communicate to infrastructure, the infrastructure handles the downlink, and you just go to a website, and there's all your data, and you send commands to the satellite. It's 24-7 available to you. It's kind of like those amateur telescopes you can buy now that you don't sit behind them with the eyepiece. You put the telescope on the roof or on the deck of your house. You sit in front of your PC with a Wi-Fi connection to the satellite and you, to the telescope, and you see what's on the screen, and you direct the telescope. And you don't have to be out in the cold at 3 in the morning. You can do it you know, from home, even from a remote location. Leave the briefcase at some place where you have great viewing at your country house in Maine or something like that. And then you can be sitting wherever you live in Delaware or something where there's just incredible light pollution and you can't see up through the humid atmosphere, having a great viewing experience with your satellite. And that's the virtual world that um, infrastructure would bring to our satellites. And there's things like improvements in robotics that could make the escort type satellite a, a little bit better and a little bit more reliable. And I think that will happen as robotics, particularly robotics in space, come along. And then there's a push toward higher and higher frequencies, meaning higher and higher bandwidth. And so the idea, even without infrastructure, of a gigabit per second CubeSat is a totally uh, doable thing. Then in the same category as replacing macro with micro, there's a lot of talk about, OK, could we make a synthetic aperture of hundreds of satellites? And I have to sort of stop myself right there, because it, in theory, you can. But in practice, nobody's done it. And we're still talking about it. I have some slides on that um, you know, in a minute. Then I just wanted to mention uh, a topic that's being worked on, particularly by Alex Skolker at um, Skoltech, which is the federation of satellites. Some federations are willing federations. All the states sign up. We want to be a part of your federation. It's kind of like the United States. I mean, we didn't have to conquer them too badly to get the states to line up and organize into the United States. But on the other hand, some federations are forced federations. And then some federations are opportunistic federations. You're federated with someone else because it's advantageous to you to have your military base in someone else's country. So as soon as you build a military base in someone else's country, in a sense, they become a part of your country. At least the base is a part of your country. So federated, what does that mean in the satellite context? It means I've got a satellite and you're going to use me. You're going to use my communication link when I'm not fully using it to downlink some of your data. And as we move into a world with thousands and thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit, there's always somebody that's not very far away from you. And maybe they've got a high bandwidth active downlink, and therefore you don't need one. And that was really how the internet grew in the first place. There were a lot of servers, and they agreed to be federated. They agreed to cooperate with other servers. So I've got a message in Rhode Island. I want to send it to somebody in AMSAT in California. And that message goes to the Brown University server, which goes to the Yukon server, which goes to the State University of New York. I mean, a lot of them were, were um, corporate and university servers. And eventually, and it was sometimes that eventually was many minutes later, that message would find its way to a server near where my friend lived in California. He would log on to his favorite server, and there was the message. And that's how email started working. It was a federated system. So that could be a game changer for small satellites if we convince people to participate, just like the internet required people to be interested in participating. In fact, it became um, very advantageous to them to do that. My final slide on replacing macro with micro is I don't think we really want to go there. I think we want to leave big missions to big satellites and go our own way in terms of missions. Last night, I talked about the two examples I really like the best of this. What happened to the IBM PC? 
right? Well, the IBM PC eventually, you know, way outgrew the typewriter. And it became the standard tool for office workers, for scientific workers, and really for graphics workers. If it wasn't the IBM PC, it was the equivalent in the Apple world that was more popular with graphics, page layout, all those architecture, all those things happened on that. And now, companies feel that that's a stagnant market. And where is the growth in personal computing, tablets, and smartphones? There's so many more tablets and smartphones sold now that the PC market has become a commodity market. Prices are very low, profit margins are very low, and they're pretty much all the same. But in the tablet world and in the smartphone world, the profit margins are large. There's a lot of differentiation. There's a lot of technical growth. And the interesting thing about that looming market of a billion, uh, kind of a billion smartphones in circulation on the planet right now is they don't do anything that the IBM PC does particularly well. So if I try to sell you a smartphone, and I t you can get rid of your IBM PC, buy this smartphone, you're going to buy it, and you're going to say, Rick, it's really terrible at word processing and spreadsheets. I can only see like five cells at a time or six, and I can hardly operate on it because when I operate on it, I can't tell what's happening to all the other cells. I'm constantly scrolling up and down, scrolling up and down. You wouldn't buy that. There wouldn't be a billion people using smartphones. If you really want to move smartphones, you don't sell them as a replacement for an IBM PC. You say to people, yeah, it'll do some of the things your PC will do. You can do email when you're on the road, realizing that it's much nicer to do email when you have a nice big screen and a keyboard. But you can do email, and a lot of people don't type anyway, so they're just as happy to do that. And yeah, it does it, right? It doesn't do it great, but it does it good enough. And you can do all these other things, like talk on the phone, which is very hard to do on your IBM PC. Like One of my favorite things to do with my smartphone is talk on Skype and treat it like a cordless phone or like, or like my cell phone. Because I don't like talking on Skype on my PC because I have to sit in front of my desk. I can't like wash the dishes or fold laundry or anything. But with my smartphone, I can talk on Skype. So there's all these things that I can do with my smartphone that I can't do on the PC or that I don't want to do on the PC. And that made the smartphone what it is. All the little square buttons with all the little apps that you want to do, you don't do any of those things on your PC, or if you do, you don't have it with you, right? It's inconvenient, but it's doable. I mean, you could check the weather forecast while you're getting dressed in the morning, but you'd have to sit down at your desk, fire up the PC, blah, 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 fire up your browser, go to the site, whereas with the smartphone, you, you know, you basically, it's on all the time, you just press the button and you have the weather forecast, you know, media or whatever the button is called on it. So, that's the lesson for us small satellite people. To me, it's a moot point. Can we replace macro with micro? Who cares? Do I want to do that? I mean, they don't sell that many of those macro satellites anyway, and it's boring. We're already doing that. Why should I do all this work just to redo what people have already done? You know, basically just to land on the moon again and do it in a smaller package, and I'm going to dedicate my life to that? It's like my mother didn't raise me to do that. Okay, so another example is the SIM card. Originally, a cell phone was just a cordless telephone. You did the exact same thing you did with a telephone. Now, 90% of what we do with a telephone, cell phone, we never did on a we never did on a cordless phone or on a line telephone. Well, for one thing, it wasn't smart. So it didn't have the internet. It didn't have texting. It didn't have WhatsApp. You know, the obvious things. And of course, all the frivolous apps, well, they're not always frivolous apps, but you know, you have cameras. You know, a lot of people use the smartphone. You see this on the Metro all the time. Using the smartphone as a mirror, right? Because you can just turn the camera on that faces you, and you can like do your makeup or check your hair or whatever it is, do your tie before you get out of the metro. So your smartphone is a mirror. You think, well, you could just carry a mirror, but you don't need to. Your smartphone is a flashlight. You could just carry a flashlight. Yeah, I could carry a thousand other things, but I don't need to because my smartphone does all that. It's a QR reader. I, I can do all these just for the QR reader. It's worth it. It's very unhandy to take even your laptop and hold it up to a billboard in the airport to go to the website that they want to drive you to to get a discount on something or to look at a new product that you're particularly interested in. Whereas with your smartphone, you just hold it up, press the QR reader, and it goes right to that site. So those are apps that make the smartphone so cool that you're going to spend as much for that smartphone as you would have spent to buy a full-size PC with a keyboard and a, and a nice monitor and everything else. Okay. So in the case of these SIM cards, the latest thing that they do is they do machine-to-machine -machine communication, which is not exactly something you wanted your lined dial telephone to do that was sitting in you know, your parents' house in 1959. And what this means is you get a SIM card, and nobody has that SIM card. That SIM card is assigned to your car keys and your house keys that are on a key ring. 
And if you lose them, you call them. And the SIM card answers you. And geolocating, the way SIM cards can do using all the cell towers, it tells you exactly where they are. So then you realize that you left them in the restaurant, you left them in your office, you left them in a cab, possibly. But you at least know where they are, or you just drop them in the hall. That, you know, mostly when you lose your keys, they're like, you know, on the bed or something like that. Knowing that it's sitting in the house, you're at least like, okay, I didn't really lose my keys. They're someplace in the damn house. I'll find them, right? There are more SIM cards running, talking to machines, sending messages from machines than there are SIM cards running cell phones. 